Friends, God's good word that we'll consider off and on this morning uh, is both Exodus 20 and John chapter 2, if you'd like to keep that open as we hear God's word. John chapter 2 in particular, if you want to find it, it's on 861 in that Bible there, the white and blue one in front of you. I've got a system for almost everything in my life. Maybe you do too. I've got a financial system. We post our receipts on the refrigerator so I can keep track of the household expenses that I need to deduct out of my uh, income. And we put then our expenses into a budgeting software. The budgeting software has four rules, and as long as I follow the rules, we will generally come out in the black for the month. Then we've got larger financial goals, and we do a financial review every month, and an annual financial review to see if we're making progress towards those goals. And to be honest, right, like, I don't know about you, but I I trust the system. I, I trust the system that we've built and we've refined over the years, and I fully expect that if I follow the system for the next 20 years, that I'll be financially okay. Now, that's honestly probably a pretty bad idea, and you all know that it's a pretty bad idea because systems very often fail us, and life happens and breaks the system, but still, I generally trust that the system will work out. And and I've got a health system or a physical fitness system. I've got a little uh, system that tells me, here's what you're supposed to do for your workout today, and I put in that I did it or not, and this is how hard it was, and and then it spits out another workout for me tomorrow so that I can keep working on improving my health. Uh, I've got a system, and I've got a system for everything, right? I've got a system to track attendance. You probably noticed that I I try to take a little picture here because I got a down who is all here and who's not here, and then follow up and see that, right? I've got the system for that. I have got a system for what else? For personal Bible study and for family Bible study. We've got a, a food plan. We've got a, a food plan. You know, I got to wake up. I wake up every morning and I know what we're going to eat. And if we're going to change the food plan, we have to have a discussion to change the system. I know, right? Overwhelming. I, I cannot handle, we got so much stuff going on in life, I cannot handle not having a system for it all. And the one place where maybe my system is, is not the best, where I need to grow the system, is my, my soul system. Maybe you all saw, some of you saw the movie Soul that Pixar put out a few, few years ago. Uh, it was a funny movie about these, t- these a couple of ghost spirits, souls, right, uh, on their way to the afterlife. But it made me, made me realize, you know, how good is my soul system, the system that I've built to grow my soul and then set it on an eternal path. Because the reality is, if you, if you look at the scriptures, well, we're going to see it today, most systems, soul systems, are nowhere near as good as we'd like them to be. Let's get a soul system today. And we start then with Exodus chapter 20. God gave his people long ago these Ten Commandments. Now, on the surface of it, that was not a big deal. There were many codes coming out to guide people's regulations, guide people's daily life. Uh, One of the most famous, right, Hammurabi's Code Perhaps you've taken some time to read through that. And the Egyptians had come out with their legal code at the same time. What was unique about those Ten Commandments? You've perhaps read them recently. You just heard them this morning. What was special? What, what drove the interest of those Ten Commandments? You notice that none of them had to do with classes, You know, here's how you treat the slaves and here's how you treat the masters. Most code systems of the day did that kind of a thing. You notice very little of it had to do with money. Nothing said you should try to obtain as much money as you can or you should try to get rid of most money. No, what did it regulate? The first three commands dealt with your soul, your position before God in the world. The other six or seven, depending on how you count it, dealt with your neighbor and how you interacted with your neighbor. In one setup, though, God had managed to give his people a set of commands that managed or regulated, controlled both their 
life with God and their behavior towards others. The ins and the outs of life, if you want to put it that way, right? The internal state of their being and their external behavior. It was not concerned with keeping hierarchies and classes. It was not concerned with protecting social structures. It preserved you. You and your place in the world. And, and you don't realize, I don't realize, right? We don't realize what a shocker this was in the systems of the world. This law code, the Ten Commandments, unturned, upturned all of those legal systems of its time. And for many years, that law code then has not only bound people, but even bound the worship life, right? The religious life of God's people. We know that God then followed up that moral law with his creation of the temple, the one place where God should be worshipped, and the entire worship practices of the people. That temple law dictated the sacrifices so that when people's souls or their behaviors fell out of practice, when you got unhealthy, you could fix your soul. In fact, it was so regulated that people had four particular festivals so that they could come around at specific times of the year and experience a refreshing, a time of renewal. They could get forgiveness. They could get new life. It was a very structured life. Here's the offering you're supposed to give. Here is the Uh, sacrifice that you're supposed to give. And here's the meal, the festival meal, the fellowship meal that you get to enjoy together so that you can be united again. See, this system, man, it worked. It worked for thousands of people. And you've perhaps noticed just how weak our real system is in comparison. Not to say that church life in modern America is really that bad. Man, we experience tons of freedoms, don't we? And yet, our system does not help much with people who are walking around with burdens of shame and guilt. We know lots of people who come to a church trying to find that forgiveness and that new life, and yet they walk away not feeling it at all, don't they? You know, you have, to, you have to work kind of around the system. You can't just show up at public church and expect that, oh, all of a sudden you're going to feel better. You need to actually talk to somebody. That's what's happened to the system. You know, most people don't participate in this church system so that they can build relationships and deep connections with other people. They'd like to do that. They'd like to see that happen. Right? But we show up for an hour on Sunday and we talk a little, hi, hi, oh, it's so nice to see you. And then we walk out of church again and, and we wonder why our souls are still flat, why they're so empty. Huh? It's not to say that we don't want that, but we don't get that, do we? You know, and, and our souls, well, we might want that renewal, that new life that people got with those four festivals, the seasons of the year, and the, the fresh start. But, well, if, if we show up for Christmas and Easter, maybe that'll, be, maybe that'll be enough. We don't realize that it's the pressure of the day-to-day and then the release of the highlights that makes that new life come to life. All it is to say is, you know, I am fine. I like our religious practices. I'm glad that we have church life, so to speak. I'm glad that we have a Christian life. And yet, I know, you know, don't we, that our system is not really working for so many of us. We need a a system that really works. And Jesus wants to give that same thing to the people of, of his time. He says here, He comes in and he finds that in the temple courts, people are selling cattle, sheep, and doves. Others are sitting at the table exchanging money. He made a whip out of cords. He drove them from the temple courts, the sheep and the cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. Man, this was absolutely shocking for the people of his time. You probably know that in the 
Greek world, there was plenty of religious worship. There were plenty of systems put in place. Most of the systems, though, were all about indulging yourself. There were no priests. The priests were just normally local politicians that could use the religious practices to control the people's lives. There was no standardization. There was, there was no unity. So the priest could demand whatever sacrifice he wanted from you in order to make up for your mistakes. There were even rituals that included sexual activity in the ancient Greek world. And most temples had more than a little more than, than a buying and selling going on. Now, Jesus then, he comes into this Jewish temple and he says, Oh, there's just a little bit of buying and selling going on here? Oh, they're, they're making things convenient? You mean the temple is just the center for religious life and the standardization of practices so that everybody's treated the same way? Well, still, get this stuff all out of here. Get rid of all of this junk because I will not put up with any distractions to my temple. I will not put up with anything that makes people's souls be robbed of their good place with God. We see the quote here. Jesus says, Are you turning my father's house into this what den of robbers we see in another place? And Jesus, man, he is not happy with that robbery that's going on. No, the temple is supposed to be a place where you can meet with the presence of God. And that's instead what Jesus puts in that place. In his book, Simply Christian, N.T. Wright points out that Jesus' cleansing of the temple was not a protest at the commercialization of a holy place, as we often think, but it's rather a sign that the system of the temple was obsolete and that he had come to show people the path to God. His action was an assertion of his own authority as he claimed the power which the temple had firmly had held to forgive sins and lead people to God. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is the true temple. In every other temple, you bring sacrifices. In every other temple, you bridge the gap. In every other religious system, practice in coming to this church and everywhere else, right? You and I, we feel that pressure to come across the line to, to go to God. We bring the animal sacrifices, or in the ancient world, right? They would bring those animal sacrifices. You pay the price. You do the things. You do the chance. You do the work. But Jesus comes along to say, I am the altar. I am the lamb who was slain. I am the one who bridges the gap. I'm not only the Lord on the other side of the gap, right? But I'm the bridge to the other side of the gap. I have come. And when I've died on the cross, I put a bridge across the infinite bit abyss between us. It's over forever. That is what Jesus wants to say. Now, you can I, do we hardly get the power of this? I think about this a little bit because I, I have so many people who call church and they call the main office and they want to negotiate or navigate out some purchase that they want our business to make. So for example, this last week, the copier printer lady called. She calls and says, hello, yes, I need to speak with the person in charge of managing your, your copy or your printer. We need to negotiate it out a new contract. Now it's so funny to start these conversations, right? Because because they don't know the rules of our business. They don't know how the business works and how it gets played. Uh, so as they talk out on this conversation, they're, they're trying to feel out the rules and they're trying to win our favor. So she says, so are you happy with your copy right now? Do you like it? What can we do to make it better? And I'm like, lady, just tell me how much the new one is going to cost me. And, and she's, well, I, I want to make sure you're happy and we'll try to match whatever price. And I'm like, just tell me what, right? So she's busy trying to curry favor with me until I can tell her, until I say to her, look, I'm the person who can make this decision more or less for you. I might have to run the final approval past the board, but I am the person. And you should hear the sigh of, sigh of relief that goes across the, the mind of the other person on the other end of the phone. <gasps> oh my goodness. Right? Because they finally have found the presence of the person who can make the decision. And when you and I come into the Word of God, and when we come into this church, and we come before Christ himself, we should have the same sigh of relief 
You don't have to feel like there is some game that you have to play, like you don't know the rules to get in good with God. You don't have to feel like there's incantations that you don't know. Instead, you can have that huge sigh of relief that says, the system has been changed. The system has been upturned. And Jesus himself is the system. His presence is the system. And when you have him, when you know him, when you meet with him, man, your soul, it can be renewed renewed in amazing ways. And that's the last thing that God wants you and I to think through today. How do we build a soul system that doesn't try to save? See, every other religious system, every other system out there, right, is simply trying to fix our lives. Like I said, I've got a great financial system set up. I have some confidence that if I follow it in 20 years, I'm going to be financially okay. What's it trying to do? Save my life? Fix me in some small way? Now, it can't fix the whole thing. But in the same way, whatever religious system, soul system we say, built, we expect it to save us. God wants you and I to, to come up with a, a, a completely different system for our souls. He wants us to build a system that doesn't try to save us that doesn't try to fix us. He wants you and I to be part of a system and to build a system that brings our failures, our losses, our messes, our mistakes, and lets God save. Jesus says it this way at the end of our lesson. He says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And they all replied to him, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? The temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said and they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. C.S. Lewis has this really great illustration that helps us see how we can stop trying to build a system to save ourselves and just let God be the one to save. He says, think about salt. Think about salt. Now, imagine that you are a person who really doesn't know salt very well. I don't know if any of you are anti-salt people. Anybody anti-salt? You just, you hardly ever eat it in your life. You don't know it, right? And so you try salt for the first time. And, and you get this, this clump of salt, right? And you're like, ah, because you don't know what else to do with it. You just take a, a chunk out of it. Now, you're going you're gonna to be turned off beyond all belief, aren't you, right? If you put a chunk of salt in your mouth and you go, just like it's an apple, you're like, oh, this is gross. Who would want something that strong on your food? But, but then you say, well, actually, that's not how you're supposed to use salt. That's not how you eat salt. If you put a little bit of salt on your steak, it'll make it taste great. And the other morning, I made cinnamon rolls. And did you know that if you put a little bit of salt in your dough for cinnamon rolls, it'll make it taste great? And you say, how can salt make your steak taste great and your cinnamon rolls taste great? Trust me, it will. In fact, your cinnamon rolls will turn out terrible without salt. And I made pancakes right after that. And guess what I put in the pancakes? Salt. It makes the pancakes taste taste great too. Why? A little bit of salt, sure, it goes a long way, right? But it brings out all of the flavors. It brings out what is best in all of it, and it kills all of those bad flavors. And and C.S. Lewis points out, he says, you know, putting Jesus, putting this Christ into your life and making him the the system of your soul, it's the very thing that's going to kill all of the excesses, all of the greed, all of the evil, all of the sin in your soul. And it's going to bring out all of the flavor, all of the richness, all of the beauty and the power and the glory that God has put in you. It's the one thing that will actually save you. Now, if you, if you don't know what to do with him, if you don't know how to have him, and you just take a huge bite out of it, a huge chunk out of it, he'll dis- destroy your life. Just like taking a huge bite out of salt, he's got so much power in him. Just like these Jews discovered, he ripped apart their temple and he said, you know, your souls are a mess and you've created a wreck of a system. 
And you and I might experience the same thing. If you come face to face with the power of the living God, how can you handle that fire and put it into your life? But if you take him as he actually is, the crucified and risen Lord, the one who gave up his life so that you can have life, the one who has risen and ascended on high so that you can live again, and you sprinkle him into your life, he will slowly kill out all of the excesses, he will fill in all of the death and the failure, and he will bring out what is the very best in you. Your soul will live again. Friends, this is Jesus, the temple of God. He is your soul system. And he's the one that you need to fill your soul with. Now, I've, I've been through this myself, and maybe some of you have too. Have you ever had a, a time, a, a season in your life, where you took a look at Jesus so seriously, so radically, that you were almost burned by that look? I remember there was a, a couple of years in my life, right, where I was really think, thinking about who Jesus was and comparing him with my life, and it just about ate me alive. Because every time I looked at what he did and I looked at what I did and looked at how I felt and what he thought, I thought, man, I can't, I can't match that at all. I'm a, I'm a train wreck. I'm a disaster. And I literally got to the place where I was saying, I'm afraid of God. It burned my soul. And maybe some of you have gotten to that place as well. And if you have, right, then you also need to say, I need to keep that salt in my life. I need to keep sprinkling that salt a little bit at a time so that my death and my sins and my failures are all filled in and they're flavored. There's new life that's brought out by the salt of his forgiveness, of his grace, of his death for me. See the temple in your soul and let his body offer up for you all of these sacrifices so that you and I, we can walk around again and say, man, I'm alive. I am filled with this grace of God. Not a single one of us should walk around this place with flat faces. There should never be a moment here where we walk around and we say, oh man, this is just... Uh you know, here we go again. No, right? The Son of God has come alive within you. He has sprinkled you with the fire of an everlasting life. Your hearts, your minds, your souls should roar with the glory of God. For the temple of God has come into you. The presence of God has taken place within you. And friends, you and I are saved. So stop trying to build a system that saves yourself. Build a system that exposes the weaknesses of your soul and sprinkle those weaknesses, that death, with the salt of his life. Sprinkle his, your life with the system of Christ, and then you'll really be saved. Let's pray for that. Lord God, we, we keep trying to build our own systems like the, like the people of old, like those Jewish believers. Yes, they, they wanted all that you gave, but they filled up their souls with something else. And like many people today, we, we easily fall into the traps of building up our own systems